All right. Today is Sunday, the 17th of November. This is a recap for the stock market activities for the week that was and an outlook for the week to come. Now, folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And let's begin with the fact that uh, we have seen uh, record inflows into the stock market after the post elections optimism, also known as orange optimism. We poured billions and billions and billions of dollars chasing this uh, orange optimism, but uh, it appears that the orange got squeezed and it's over now. Everybody who bought and chased the post elections rally is now underwater. It feels like getting conned. Not as bad as what happened over the weekend in Netflix with the fake fight, but uh, close enough. And by the way, the beauty of the stock market is if you're pissed off at Netflix, you know what to do on Monday. Puts all in, hit the stock, send them a message. You're not ready to stream anything live here. I don't care if you got 60 million, 80 million, 100 million watching the show, who cares? That's not going to increase the revenue stream. Anyways, we're talking about a lot of money here that uh, got blown up. We're talking about record inflows in U.S. large cap equities funds, about over $40 billion chasing the rally. And uh, all of that is kaput right now. And of course, geniuses that we are, we sold gold to chase the fake rally. Let's dump the most reliable asset out there and chase the fake assets because what again? Anyways, uh, the majority of the stampede, of course, is happening from uh, retail inflows. No surprise here. Even though the insiders, the executives, the oligarchy, they're all dumping stacks, billions and billions and billions of dollars. The rich dumps, the poor buys. Nothing to see here. What is the reason of this sudden change in sentiment? Because we talked about how everybody was optimistic and, uh, or Trump is going to be good for this and good for that. Uh, and all of a sudden we have a change in sentiment comes Friday. Maybe we go back to last weekend's video. We talked about the glass half full and the glass half empty of the upcoming Trump presidency. And last week and all the way till uh, late this week, everybody was looking at the glass half full. But as the policy begins to formulate, the market begins to realize the half-empty side of the glass. Among the policy concerns, of course, for the market is instability, surprises, and uncertainty. There's one thing that the market doesn't like, which is uncertainty. And some of the announcements of the Trump cabinet introduced a lot of uncertainty to the stock market. The latest, of course, being RFK Jr. becoming the health secretary of this country. We talked about that in details in a previous video. But uh, it appears that our concerns about RFK Jr. should be alleviated by now. Because the whole thing about Make America Healthy Again is just perhaps another con, just stack the stock market and Netflix. But it seems to me here, I don't know if you saw this or not, but uh, it appears that RFK Jr. got uh, ambushed here into a trap, uh, just like uh, a lot of traders in the stock market this week. He was invited to Trump's plane only to find himself invited to eat some McDonald's. And look at his face. He's like, uh, I guess we gotta do, we'll make America healthy again next year. And I don't know if you caught this or not, but it appears that uh, our new health secretary, assuming he gets confirmed by uh, the Senate, it seems that he's given up on this whole make America healthy again bullshit. Uh, over the weekend, RFK Jr. got caught smoking a cigarette. That's not healthy. He also got caught buying cocaine. Look at this. And uh, then he got caught uh, smoking cigarette and snorting coke at the same time. So I guess we have to change Make America Healthy Again to Make America Horny Again. I think that's more appropriate. We should create a new department called uh, the Horny Make America Horny Again Department. And it should be led by Elon Musk since uh, he's so concerned about the declining birth rate and the disappearance of the population in the United States. It's, it's a huge problem, folks. Think about it. If you need any evidence, just drive over the 405 in LA and uh, the first thing that will come to your mind is, oh, we need more people. In any case, folks, you know what bothers me? The media still doesn't get it. The headline here reads, Voters blame Biden and Harris for rising costs. Was that fair? Question mark. We asked the economists. Oh yeah, let's ask the same people who told us that inflation is transitory and we're on the path of a soft landing. And inflation is not a problem. Wages are uh, surpassing the rate of inflation. Everything is fine. So again, the question is, was it fair? for the voters to blame the Biden-Harris administration for inflation. The experts say yes, but only to a degree. Of the seven economists spoke to USA Today, most cited the global pandemic, not Biden, as the primary cause of the nation's inflation crisis. Oh, oh we have an inflation crisis now. Oh, I thought inflation is dead. But again, they're never going to admit 
that this is all because of the Federal Reserve stimulating an economy that did not need stimulation just to pump the stock market higher. Well, you're going to get inflation. And we talked about this before, that Powell and company will cost Biden the elections. And nobody wanted to believe it. Well, now you know. And it appears that Powell might also hurt the Trump administration for other reasons. We'll talk about that in a minute. But when we talk about what changed the sentiment in the stock market this week, let's look at the political risk to begin with. And of course, we have uh, the cabinet being formed right now. These are the names where no confirmation is required. These are not really, I mean, they're important positions, but there's nothing we can do about them. Uh, you see some gimmicks like the Elon Musk and uh, Ramos Maui with the Doge department. Yeah, I believe it when I see it. Elon, listen to this. The Pentagon failed its seventh annual audit in a row. It says it's still unable to fully account for its more than $424 billion budget. Maybe uh, the Doge department, uh, if it's not really just a scam to pump Doge coins or Elon Musk can dump, uh, if it is for real, I think they should tackle what's going on with the Pentagon here. Uh, a lot of money laundering is what I suspect. Problem is, if you try to investigate this properly, you're probably going to get shot. So be careful. Proceed with caution. But then we have the other cabinet members who will have an impact on the economy on many other things. And it appears so far that Trump is choosing his cabinet based on loyalty this time around. But he's not uh, avoiding the same traps that he fell into last time around, when he promised to drain the swamp and then hired the swamp. And uh, even now, the Wall Street Journal says that the Trump administration will be great for Goldman Sachs. Of course, we changed the BlackRock administration with the new Goldman Sachs administration. These appointments, I don't know what you make of them, but uh, I think the one that's going to have most trouble here is the defense secretary, at least announced for now, Pete from Fox News. And I think the deep state is not going to let that happen. Uh, and the other thing is, I like defense secretaries who can aim. And this guy cannot aim. He almost killed uh, somebody alive on TV. But anyways, the other concern, of course, is Marco Rubio for the State Department, really. Rubio is a bitch for the highest bidder. He's not going to hesitate to send your kids to die in Iran. And now he wants to add another war with Cuba. It's not just China, Russia, Iran, but let's add Cuba to the list. I think uh, Trump never learned the first rule in politics. You never hire whores in your cabinet. Because if they're willing to sell for the highest bidder, then there is always a higher bidder. What if China starts to bid for Rubio? Anyways, when we talk about the policy concerns... It ain't just the cabinets, folks. I mean, think about uh, this tweet from the senator from Vermont, Bernie Sanders, who says that uh, I look forward to work with the Trump administration on fulfilling his promise to cap credit card interest at 10%. We cannot continue to allow big banks and the billionaires and the millionaires to make record profits by ripping off Americans by charging them 25 to 30% interest rates. This is Yosemite. Um, how is that good for financials? Because a lot of the stupid rally that's going on in financials doesn't make sense at all. They say it's about deregulation optimism. Really? What, what exactly are we talking about here? And if we're going to, indeed, he's not going to do this, by the way. That's never going to happen. But if he does indeed at least try to lower the interest rate on credit cards, that's going to cause more inflation, number one, because now folks will be incentivized to use their cards even more. Uh, the other problem is it's the Federal Reserve who sets the rate. And again, the bond market also has influence in setting the rate. And we have a divergence where the Fed is cutting rates, but rates in the bond market going higher. Now, the credit card companies, is there any justification for them to charge 25 to 30% interest rate when the federal funds uh, rate is at 4 to 5%? That doesn't make sense at all. But if you do that, you're going to hammer the profits of these credit card companies and the banks. So a lot of the rally in the banks doesn't make sense to me at all. Sounds like an opportunity to short. But the other policy concern is what's going to happen with the tariffs and the trade war. And this week we got the data on China's trade. And they have a huge surplus. Now Trump is going to look at that and see it as an opportunity to introduce more tariffs. Because China's not playing fair. They're ripping us off. You know the deal. You know what's really interesting though? Because we had a president who introduced tariffs when we had such uh, inflation and mania in the stock market. And that was uh, President Hoover. Right before the crash of 1929, you can see right here that after Hoover got elected, we've seen a stock market pump as we've seen with the election of Trump. But after that, we got the Great Crash and the Great Depression. So be careful what you wish for here. Oh, the Trump administration is going to defeat inflation, no doubt in my mind. But they're going to defeat inflation by a recession. 
because historically that's the only proven way to defeat inflation. And the earlier you do it, the milder the recession. Uh, when you choose to play games and aim for soft landing and all of that, that's when you increase the severity of the recession. And that leads us, among the policy concerns, if the Trump administration indeed will uh, initiate a trade war and tariffs on Chinese products, and of course not going to be just Chinese products, will be European products and many others, wouldn't that increase the rate of inflation? Of course it will, especially in an environment that we have right now. And that leads to the other risk that soured the sentiment this week, which is, okay, if inflation is not cooperating anymore, then uh, all of this optimism about the Fed cutting rates, that should be gone out of the window, right? And it seems to be that case, specifically when we have the big zombie from the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, who came out this week after cutting rates by 75 basis points. He comes out and says that he's not in a hurry to reduce interest rates. What? You just cut rates, fool. What are you talking about? All of a sudden, he's not in a hurry anymore, which again will introduce the upcoming uh, Federal Reserve versus White House war, the Powell-Trump uh, war, which I cannot wait for that to happen. You want to buy something safe? Go invest in popcorn, because this is going to be epic, epic, epic. Uh, Trump going to reduce taxes, which will increase the deficit, and then he's going to do the trade war, which will increase inflation, and Jerome Powell will see the inflation numbers going higher again. He's going to stop cutting rates altogether, if not even hike them again. Now, that's not going to jive pretty good with the new uh, upcoming administration. You see, now, after the commentary by Powell, uh, traders became less confident of upcoming rate cuts. Midweek, traders were betting that the December 25 basis points rate cut is in the bag. But after Powell said this, and after the data came out hotter, inflation, retail sales, traders are now not sure if we're going to get a rate cut next month. And who knows what's going to happen after that? Maybe we're going to pause. And after a pause, if inflation continues to recover, we're probably going to talk about interest rate hikes again. At least this is what the bond market is suggesting. Look at the change that we got, folks, right after the Federal Reserve began cutting rates. Huge. We're going to look back at the 50 basis points that Jay Powell did in September as one of the biggest mistakes in Federal Reserve history. Because the moment he cut rates, all of a sudden, the market was expecting rates to go below 3%. But after the cuts, expectations for the rate went all the way back to 4%. As to say, Mr. Powell, you've made a mistake. You have reintroduced the inflation problem once again. And this week, we got data about the CPI. And again, it appears that the CPI just stopped going down anymore. And if you look at any of the sophisticated inflation measures, like the trimmed mean CPI, sticky CPI, median CPI, and even core CPI, to be honest with you, all of them appear to be found a bottom, and they're about to move higher again. The mistake is, you're not going to cut rates and ease the policy when these measures are not even close to your 2% target. A lot of the reduction in the inflation rate came in the backs of energy. We know how volatile energy can be. And with the geopolitical situation that we have, I mean, just today we got the news that the Biden administration is allowing Ukraine to use long-range missiles against Russia. Russia says they're going to use nuclear weapons in response. Introduce just a little bit of geopolitical tensions and you'll see oil coming back up again. And then what happens? That's the other wild card that could be reintroduced along with the, the tariffs and the trade wars and the other inflation metrics that actually went higher, such as transportation costs, shelter, and medical services. And again, folks, let's go back to the 1970s. Everybody assumed that inflation is dead, it's over. And they begin to ease prematurely. The next thing you know, we have not just a doubleheader, but a resurgence, a second wave that dwarfs the first wave of inflation. And if we get there, folks, the Great Depression 2.0 is guaranteed because rates will go significantly higher until they blow a lot of things in the economy. And then the Fed and the government will be forced to reduce rates and stimulate the economy, but without eradicating inflation altogether, because now we have uh, devaluation of the dollar, which will move commodities prices higher. Bear in mind that all of this inflation problem, and we'll be talking about this in this channel for a long time, the dual risk. You got your inflation risk, but you also got your recession risk. And again, the earlier in the cycle where you choose, okay, I got an inflation problem, let's crash the market by 20-30%, introduce a mild recession just to get rid of inflation, and then we can rebuild again. In two, three years, we'll be back with no inflation problem at all. 
But again, the longer you allow inflation to exist in the economy and you aim for that soft landing, you're going to have both problems. Inflation sticky and recession being reintroduced. And it's going to lead to a disaster. With the inflation risk, we still have the recession risk. Uh, think about what's going on in the jobs market. The latest headline is GM laying off 1,000 employees. And let's be honest here, folks. Why is the Federal Reserve all of a sudden, if you listen to Powell in the latest FOMC and before that, he talked about how he's now concentrating more on the employment mandate, not the inflation mandate or the price stability, as they call it. I think because the Federal Reserve has data that you and I don't see, the reality of the jobs market, if you take out the part-time jobs and folks working two to three jobs. The reality of the jobs market, it ain't that pretty at all. Just think about all of the revisions that we got before. So I think that the Federal Reserve has data that shows that the jobs market is much, much weaker than we've been told. And it's making the Federal Reserve officials shit their pants. And now they have to ignore the inflation problem to remedy that recession problem in the jobs market. And in doing that, along with the policies coming from the new administration, the inflation risk will make a comeback. And then they have to switch and tackle the inflation risk. And as they do that, the recession risk is amplified. And it just becomes a losing game at that point. Now, all of this is happening, folks, when we talk about why did the sentiment in the market sour? We talked about the policy risk. We talked about the interest rate risk and inflation, all of that. The other risk is that the market is not in a good place right now. It's not a cheap market where we can just excuse all of these problems and say, you know what, let's look at the glass half full side of the equation. The market is extremely overbought and overvalued right now. When you look at the S&P equal weight, 24 and 25 earnings estimate, uh, it's collapsing while the indices is going higher. The market should be down big, but it's moving higher based on hopium, AI, oh, the orange optimism, this and that, the soft landing. All of that is just air, otherwise known as a bubble. And all bubbles act and react the same way. They snap back to reality sooner than later. And the victims, it ain't the Bezos who's dumping billions of billions of dollars. It ain't the, the insiders. Corporate insiders are already cashing out. It's the regular folks. The retirees, the retail investors who chase the mania. How could the market pump higher? Well, we have earnings estimates actually going below one year ago. Earning estimates are now going negative, and the stock market is making new highs based on that. That doesn't make sense at all. When you look at the price-to-sales ratio, price-to-book ratio, the market is very, very expensive. When you have a market this expensive, it is priced for perfection. Introduce any problem to negate the perfection that is priced in, and you're going to see violent reactions to the downside. Furthermore, the market is way too expensive. But it doesn't make sense at all. It's not paying us any yield. Matter of fact, the compensation for holding the risk in the stock market is the lowest versus bonds in the summer of 2007. If you look at it from the S&P 500 X escape yield, it is the worst risk versus reward since 2002. It just doesn't make sense at all. And this is why we see uh, money market fund assets continuing to move higher. Now sitting at about $6.7 trillion. You remember all of the perma pumpers who came out in CNBC and said, oh, wait till all of the trillions of dollars come out of money market funds and the market is going to continue to go higher. Why? Why would I take my money out of money market funds when the rates are going higher and the risk versus reward in the market doesn't make sense at all? You will see more money coming out of the market and chasing money market funds. After the crash, we may, depending on the situation, may migrate some of these uh, money market funds back into the equities market. So again, folks, it is a lethal combination when you have a policy risk and uncertainty because of the uh, president-elect administration. And on top of that, now we have uncertainty about the Fed's policy. We priced in the fact that the Fed is going to continue to cut rates. Now we're not sure. And on top of that, you have a market that is priced to perfection. Just the combination doesn't make sense, folks. Now let's talk about uh, the strategy for this week because Friday, of course, was OPEX and a lot of folks chased the post-elections rally using call options. Now, the market maker is not dumb. Uh, he, she, it, they, not going to reward you the easy way. Their job is to trick everybody and make the majority of traders lose money. So when folks chase the call options with weekly expiration, in this case was the monthly expiration too, the market maker has to drop the price Thursday, Friday to make sure that the majority of these calls expire worthless. And this is why we said in the morning brief Friday, we can pause this and read it for your own, but I produce a morning brief every day to my uh, members. And we said basically that we're looking for options expiration. The market maker is looking for a max pain number. And this number is SPY 585. The reason is if you look at the change in open interest, these are the puts 
for the expiration date of last Friday. You can see that uh, traders increased their puts position Thursday and they held these positions all the way to Friday. So they've influenced the market maker to say, look, you have a huge risk here of inverse gamma. So you have market maker hedge against this risk by dumping the market. Now, the market maker would do that if it looks at the other side, the calls, and sees that they have an opening, meaning that folks with calls in the money, cutting their positions, booking profits, or folks bought calls way out of the money. And this was the case. Uh, the folks who were betting on the puts bought in the money, out of the money. Folks who were betting for calls, of course, they were betting out of the money. So the market maker saw an opening there, dropped the market down, reduced the risk of an inverse gamma from the puts. But there is a number in the calls, which is the highest number of open interest, which was 585, where they don't want to drop below. Because if you drop below that number, you're going to reward the highest number of open interest in the puts at 585. That's going to obligate the market maker to buy the market at 585 after the bell. And they don't want to do that. So the way I read the tape is they're probably going to drop SPY to 585, then close it a touch above 585. That way you shake out the majority of call and put options holders around the 585 strike. This was the case. We closed a touch above 585. What can we do this week? Because it's going to be an important week in the hierarchy of events. We don't need to even talk about it. The number one event for the market is NVIDIA. That's the most important thing. You live by the sword, you die by the sword, and the sword is NVIDIA. It is what caused this insanity and divergences that we've seen in the market. And the bar is way too high. Either NVIDIA delivers and saves the market, or it's going to be the nuke that destroys the market and ends all of this insanity once and for all. So that comes at number one and maybe a close number two. Say NVIDIA comes out as a nothing burger, which I don't think it's going to be the case. But suppose that's what's going to happen. Number two is the policy risk. We're going to continue to see more and more cabinet uh, appointments, and the market will continue to assess the risk. You've seen what happened to healthcare stocks, food stocks, the moment we got the announcement of RFK Jr. We will get more and more appointments, and you'll see reactions in the stock market too. But from a trading perspective, I think we did pretty good this week with the butterfly puts on Amazon, Microsoft, AMD, NVIDIA. All of them worked out, but we got some long positions that also worked out in DraftKings on Monday. It was up over 7-8%. Uh, we bought shares in uh, some of the real estate. We'll talk about these charts in a minute in the real estate sector because you have to be picky. And the same goes with utilities uh, and staples too. I think this time around, uh, you don't want to buy the ETFs. You want to buy the individual names. Uh, the problem with the ETFs, you have one large name that goes down for whatever reason. I mean, think about healthcare. Before the RFK Jr. problem, you had an Eli Lilly problem. The biggest weight going down, it dragged the XLV down. Uh, so you have to be picky and pick the individual names that you like. Another strategy that we're going to have this week, of course, when we're talking about the post-elections optimism fading, one of the poster boys for the post-election optimism was Tesla. And I've been saying since the initial pump, don't short, don't short, not right now. I'll let you know when. I said that again in last weekend's video. Well, this week, November 11th, we got the opportunity because the IV rank for Tesla reached closer to 100. When that happens, usually have a reversal in momentum. So we did the 320, 315 diagonal put spread, bought the 320 for next week, meaning this upcoming week. We sold 315 for this week. Now the 315 expired worthless because Tesla closed above. What we've done here is we bought it back just to be uh, on the safe side, we bought it back for about 12 cents. But we opened the 307 and a half puts for next week for five and a half bucks. Now, the entry cost was less than five and a half bucks. So technically, in this trade, we got paid 15 cents to play Tesla downside. If Tesla now goes down below 320 by the end of this upcoming week, we're going to lock huge profits because we didn't pay for the trade. We got paid for the trade. Now, another trade that I did this week is for Netflix, and maybe this is going to come handy uh, this week, the 825, 810, 795 put butterfly spread. Uh, we'll see what happens, but it seems that the reaction by everybody's disappointment about the uh, Netflix boxing event over the weekend, and if that results in downside in Netflix this week, I think we're going to do pretty good in this trade. Uh, but folks, to be honest with you, you want to be as neutral as you can before NVIDIA. Because NVIDIA is going to move the market up and down in a big way. So I'd rather that I, I close a lot of the positions, the winners and the losers, uh, before NVIDIA. And then, of course, I'm going to give you a trade that uh, will enter before NVIDIA's earnings. 
give you exposure to the downside and the upside. But of course, it's going to have a slight bias to the downside because I think that's going to be the reaction based on the law of large numbers. You need to produce a number way bigger than $30 billion in revenue for the quarter. And it's going to become harder and harder to do that. Uh, not to mention, of course, all of the concerns that we have about the trade war and how it's going to impact NVIDIA vis-a-vis -vis China and the stuff that we're getting from Supermicro. And speaking of fraud, another name I'm looking at, uh, you see, we got this headline here, a reminder of uh, the Archegos disaster, the Bill of Wine uh, manipulation that blew up in his face. Uh, in uh, this stack right here, United Airlines, but all of the other airlines too, they're acting wacky. I mean, the rally in uh, financials doesn't make sense to me at all. It looks as an opportunity to short. And then the excessive negative reactions that we got this week in healthcare appears to me as an opportunity to buy. And the same goes for the defense contractors, by the way. They reacted to Pete from Fox News, and now uh, we have uh, news about World War III in Ukraine, so I think those are going to be bought too. But one excessive reaction here to the upside, I mean, look at this weekly chart for the ticker UAL, United Airlines. It's, it's just insanity. Stacks are not supposed to react this way. What happened to the airlines all of a sudden? They discovered gold, oh, excuse me, Bitcoin. What happened here? Part of the reason is maybe uh, we see the airliners moving in tandem with the dollar. The assumption is a higher dollar allows U.S. tourists to travel more overseas. Maybe. But I'm smelling sort of a Bill Huang situation here. And I'm looking for an entry, a big one. I tried a small one, didn't work out. Maybe a big one here. And maybe I'm going to be as lucky as I did back in Paramount. You look at this chart. And some of you old timers remember that I shorted it uh, closer to the top before the crash. It wasn't because I'm a genius. It was just a coincidence. Or I thought the chart was way overbought, placed a short on it. Next thing you know, it crashed down because of the Bill Wang news, which I had absolutely no knowledge about. I think we have a similar situation going on here with the airliners, but specifically United Airlines. So maybe that's going to be another idea for this week. But besides that, it's all going to be about NVIDIA, folks. So buckle up your seatbelts. We're going to have an important conversation as we head closer to Wednesday when we get NVIDIA's earnings. But besides that, let's add more color to the conversation we just had by revisiting the market information beginning with the closing of the indices on Friday. And uh, here we go. The diamonds closing in the red down by 305.87 points or a loss of 7 tenths of a percent. The biggest loser is the NASDAQ, and the reason is the VIX rebanded higher, as we anticipated, and the VIX dominates if you go back to the technical chart that I gave you before. You have three markets, not one market, you have three markets. You have a market dominated by yields. That's the IWM, for example, when we talk about the indices. You have a market that is dominated by the dollar. That's commodities, metals, and many more. You have a market that is dominated by the volatility, and that is the big caps, the indices. So we see the NASDAQ as the biggest casualty since we've seen a rip in the VIX on Friday, down 427.53 points, or a loss of 2.34%. The spider also heavy weight in the big cap technology stacks, so we see it down. 78.65 points, or a loss of 1.32%. The Russell 2000 looked pretty good in the beginning of the week, and then flushed it all back. And uh, Friday was no exception. It lost 3.46 points, or a loss of almost 1.5%. Looking at the sectors on Friday, all negative, led by technology. That's the VIX. We see a pullback in the big caps right away. Healthcare, that's the RFK Jr. And the only winners, let's say the most dominant winner was utilities. That's the risk-off segment. With that comes real estate. But I'm going to explain to you that real estate is not really a risk-off like utilities, it's mostly risk on. There are names that are risk off, and this is why you have to be picky. But we see again financials positive on uh, on Friday. They pay dividends, sure, got it. Higher interest rates, sure, got it. But at the same time, they have a problem with health and maturity assets. They got a problem with the exposure to the economy, loan generation, the weakness in, in credit cards, and consumer spending and delinquencies. And that's going to get worse if rates continue to go higher. So, Again, the rally in financials just doesn't make sense to me at all. But guess what? Contrast the picture from the day to the weekly performance. And you see financials on top. Number one, followed by energy. The only two positive sectors for the week. The rest all lagging. Led by healthcare. That's your RFK Jr. pessimism. Metals because the dollar been ripping higher. And then you got technology because we've seen a rip in the VIX. As we see investors uh, looking at the glass half empty and de-risking a little bit, we will look at the chart of the VIX in a minute, but before we do that, what about the breadth on Friday? Not looking pretty good, even if you look under the hood. So if you don't look under the hood, you just look at the uh, volume, including the big caps. Doesn't look good. 
The NYC 35% advancing, 64% declining. The NASDAQ 24% advancing, 74% declining. But you see the uh, 236 new 52-week lows versus only 41 new 52-week highs. So it wasn't even a rotational kind of move here. It was just bad across the board. Looking at the heat map from Friday, you see it right away. I mean, when you have a day where Amazon is down four, Meta down four, Microsoft almost three, and Nvidia three and a quarter, that's going to do damage. Not to mention, of course, Google, Apple, all of them down. Uh, the message is, it's kind of weird even Friday, because we knew that with the Trump administration, you got to be really careful about uh, exposure to semiconductors and the aggressiveness and the hawkish, hawkishness against China. So we've seen chips being the weaker spot in the market. That's not a surprise. And folks are trying to play cute games. For example, okay, let's take profits from the chips, but let's rotate them as something that's been lagging. And it was software throughout the week. Software did pretty good, but then it became really excessive in the charts too. So Friday, they sold the chips and software. We didn't see a migration back from software into chips. What is the message from all of this? NVIDIA, NVIDIA, NVIDIA. Either NVIDIA is going to save or the souring sentiment against semiconductors will be exacerbated in a big way this upcoming week. If NVIDIA misses or if NVIDIA disappoints, doesn't need to miss, just disappoints. That'll be good enough because the flows were already negative on semiconductors. Now, will they go back to software if we see a correction of the overbought conditions? That remains to be seen because NVIDIA has a huge weight in the entirety of the ecology of technology. All of them been moving higher and catching optimism based on AI. If the most important name in AI disappoints, then it's probably a bad leading indicator for pretty much every technology exposure. And now the question becomes, okay, where will the flow go? If it's going to come out of technology, assumes that NVIDIA disappoints, where are we going to go here? Financials again? Financials is way too overbought right now. and It just doesn't make sense at all. How far can we pump JP Morgan higher? When the company, the bank itself, and JP Demon himself says, watch out, you guys are going crazy here. We're not seeing all of the optimism that you folks are seeing. W when they're stampeding to buy Berkshire Hathaway, even though Buffett is dumping stock, he's not buying back his stock anymore. He's warning against Bank of America. Yet, somehow, we're buying Bank of America. So it doesn't make sense to me at all. What else are we going to chase? The industrials? I think the sentiment will sour there too, because we have to think about the tariffs. A lot of these names dependent on China. And don't forget, of course, the dollar been going higher. A lot of these names are multinationals. They make a lot of revenue from overseas. With a higher dollar, that's going to be a headwind. Where are you going to go? With the higher dollar, are you going to go in metals? Not right now. You're going to go energy? Not with the dollar going higher. You're going to go with the cyclicals. When the economy is shaky and we see higher interest rates and higher dollar? Probably not. How about the staples? If we see yields going higher, a lot of the staples don't make sense. And now we have RFK Jr. hitting PepsiCo, hitting Coke, hitting a lot of the food companies and staples. So you have to be selective. I'm picking uh, Procter & Gamble. It gives me good exposure to staples, good dividend, but not a lot of exposure to the risky elements that we see in consumer defensives. Will the flow go to real estate? Maybe, but you have to be selective. You see the southern side of real estate is negative on Friday. The northern part, the safer side, uh, like American Tower, like uh, public storage, all these names moving higher, so you have to be picky. Utilities, depends. I mean, they're not cheap, to be honest with you. I think the opportunity would be in the names that got hammered in healthcare. They're down big on Friday. And if you look at the contrast for the week, they're down big for the week. And again, if NVIDIA disappoints, then where would the flow go? Buying bonds? Money market funds? Maybe? Gold? That makes sense. Gold makes sense because it's oversold right now. If you wanted to buy gold, you're getting an opportunity. But on the other hand, the dollar is going higher. So I think that healthcare will make a good buying opportunity, but the timing is always critical. Uh, maybe now that we're changing Make America Healthy Again to Make America Horny Again, maybe it's going to be good uh, to buy healthcare and the timing is right now. We will see. But again, you look at the contrast here between the daily and the weekly heat map, it's not that different. You just see brighter colors, uh, greener. I should say, in software, and you see the overreactions. The market is really generous right now to anything that beats. So you look at Disney, up 16% for the week. Shopify, 25%. Palantir, it has its own circumstances of the optimism of the NASDAQ and all of that, but it is up double digits for the week. Square, same thing. Uh, you have the uh, crypto still working, so MicroStrategy was one of the biggest winners for the week. 
Spotify. Huge pop this week. And the report was good, but not that good. Not 14.5% good. But again, you see the market being really generous to any uh, bead higher. And the market is being really generous to financials. Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, even Schwab. Really? Schwab is safe now with higher interest rates? Give me a break. So some things in this map make sense. The pullback from the big caps, from chips, from some of the industrials, that makes sense. But a lot of stuff doesn't make sense either, which is the pump what we see in financials and the overreactions that we see in some of the names that reported earnings. So we'll see how we balance this picture next week. When we look at the heat map for the ETFs, just another illustration for you. TLT down, that means yields are up big. Uh, so that's not going to be good for anything that is yield sensitive or a bead risk on like the IWM or the XPI Biotech got clobbered, uh, XRT Retail, XHB Home Builders. The exception is the KRE because I think it's catching the same tailwind that the XLF is catching, financials. But even the risk off segment of yield sensitive like XLP Staples, IYR Real Estate, XLU Utilities, XLV Healthcare, all of them were laggards. Uh, when rates go higher, hard to perform. When rates go down, we have to ask why. If it is for the good reasons, we go with the risk on, like the IWM. If it is for the wrong reasons, we go with the risk off, like XLP, XLU. But like I said, pick the individual names. Uh, the ETFs right now don't make sense at all. Now, besides that, the dollar was higher for the week. So we see gold, gold miners, GDX getting hammered for the week. We see the Chinese names, also dollar sensitive, getting hammered for the week. What's not getting hammered right now, at least, is cryptos. Cryptos did pretty good for the week and they're still holding, but I think they're going to be next. Moving on to commodities, this is the picture from Friday. The dollar pulled back a tick and that was good enough to produce a rebound because, to be honest with you, the Japanese yen was up about 1%. That was part of the reason why the dollar pulled back. It ain't because we got bad data or the Fed is going to begin cutting rates again. It's because the Japanese yen moving higher. And right off the gate, we see grains catching a rebound. It's a nice rebound, but not enough uh, to turn the picture bullish yet in grains. Palladium, finally catching a bid, about 2.5% of metals, but the rest, copper, platinum, silver, gold, remain muted. Now, palladium is highly sensitive to the dollar. And if we see the dollar pulling back, palladium is going to give you big, big gains because it gave you big gains 2.25% when the dollar was just down a tick. Problem is when and how will the relentless dollar give up in the meantime we talked about the three amigos in softs those are the ones that right now don't care about the dollar they keep going higher either way coffee oj coco we've been talking about this throughout the week and even before the week these are the three that look pretty good and they keep going higher if you look at the chart of coco weekly chart you want to know why folks are pissed off the simple pleasure of buying chocolate is now becoming luxury and by the look of it it looks like cocoa prices are heading higher from this point on energy was not looking good in the charts we pointed that out in thursday's video when we see a pullback in wti in brent and our bob in heating oil but not gas caught a rebound even though after massive declines the day prior even though it did not hurt the weekly performance of natural gas remains one of the winners for the week up about six and a quarter percent but it was up way more it gave up a lot of that on thursday's session but you see cocoa up about 22 percent coffee up about 13 percent the laggards soybean oil cotton wti energy gold palladium wasn't a good week for commodities when the dollar continues to go higher <music> moving on to the big casino options what do we see here it was options expiration friday so we're going to be a little busier than usual the volume is higher specifically on the names with the highest demand like nvidia tesla palantir amazon and even super micro we see elevated demand for the volume the majority is still buying calls the exception is super micro where we see folks buying uh, puts more than calls in the name but now look at the iv rank 100 so this is the most expensive that puts been in the super micro going back a year so it doesn't make sense that it will continue to go down we said that in thursday that we anticipate a rebound friday we got a rebound about three percent or so uh, now it depends if the iv rank monday cools off to 80 uh, 70 now it depends on what do you see in nvidia's earnings if nvidia comes out bad oh super micro will flush down big but if nvidia delivers we could see actually some short covering happening in super micro so it's going to be one of the most inter interesting names uh, even though it's not really re reporting earnings and they missed out on the uh filing deadline what's going to be interesting too is microsoft 
So a lot of folks want to bid on NVIDIA before earnings. You're going to pay, of course, because the premiums are high as we hit the earnings. But you can play proxies. I think one of the proxies will be Microsoft, because if there is bad news from NVIDIA, it's probably going to be bad for Microsoft. And right now, Microsoft options are cheap, or at least cheap-ish. Uh, they're the 36 IV rank. I also want to point out Palantir, because a lot of folks want to short Palantir. It does make sense, because right now the valuation is absurd. Uh, Palantir is worth more than Lockheed Martin. That doesn't make sense at all. That's not going to last. So this is on a silver platter to short the name. Uh, but you got to be careful. I'm talking about short, short, where you enter a short position, you borrow the shares. And it, then it doesn't matter if it goes 5%, 10%. So long as you set a stop loss number and you're below that number, you keep that short in time, this valuation is not going to hold. But if you're going to time it using put options, uh, that's going to be a trial and error kind of scenario. And you can have a lot of errors before you nail the timing right. So you have to be careful with that specifically with IV rank that is not really that elevated yet. It is at 60%. On Wednesday, it was way too high and we got to pull back Thursday, but that cooled off the IV rank. Now, if you want to enter new puts, you got to make sure that the IV rank is higher. And that's only going to happen if uh, Palantir pumps a little more, or we see the IV rank increasing as Palantir begins to pull back three, 4%. That would be another sign that we're heading to 100 on the downside. You should be betting on that momentum. Mr. Short Fox will do a special bonus video on uh, how to trade the IV rank, but I will show you some examples here on how to short Palantir properly uh, from some of the unusual activities that we got. But before we do that, let's look at the flows on Friday. We see positive flows buying the dip, the RFK dip in Moderna and the XPI Biotech, in IWM, in the VIX, in bonds, in gold miners, in Oracle, in TSM Taiwan, in pool. That's because Berkshire Hathaway opened a position in pool. Doesn't make sense to me, but to each his own. Not gonna uh, doubt the big buffet here, but UAL, United Airlines, they're buying still calls, uh, but we see bearish flows for Eli Lilly, E-mini Futures, Microsoft, Apple, Mini, SPY Futures, MES, Netflix, TLT, TQs. So that gives you a little bit of an idea why Netflix pulled back Friday, for example, Apple, Microsoft, and it gives you a little bit of an idea why the VIX went higher and maybe uh, that we might see rebounds in the IWM, XPI, Moderna, the stuff that went down this week. But we always love to look at the unusual activities. So let's do that. We have NVDL. That's a proxy for NVIDIA. I don't understand why folks are trading NVDL and overpaying for these options when you have NVIDIA already split for you and gave you more accessible options. This one doesn't make sense to me at all, but the traders love it. And somebody here is betting for a positive reaction from NVIDIA by buying the 80 calls and selling the 95 calls for different expiration dates, which we call a diagonal call spread. They're selling the 95 for the expiration date of this upcoming week, November 22nd. They're buying the 80 calls for December 20. Pay attention now. You gotta do it this way. If you're bullish NVIDIA and you think it's gonna go higher, buy the calls in December, but sell the spreads for November 22nd. Why? Because the implied volatility in November 22nd is way too high. So you want to be on the seller's side. The December options, calls or puts, have lower implied volatility. So the pricing is more attractive that way. And of course, it goes the other way. If you think that NVIDIA is going to go down, buy your puts for December, then sell the spreads or sell the calls. If you own NVIDIA, for example, and you want to buy puts and sell covered calls, sell the covered calls for November 22nd, then buy the puts for December. That way, you take an advantage from the variation in implied volatility. This is really important. So even though NVDL doesn't make sense to me, but it shows me that the traders are sophisticated. And in this case, they paid about one and three quarters of a million dollars for this trade. Here comes the souffle Tesla. And uh, we're still seeing gambling on this name, thinking that it's going to go higher. They're betting in, in a big way on these calls. No surprise that we got to pull back this week. Market maker, maximum pain, but we'll see what happens next week. Here, somebody bought the 330, 375, 340, 360. All calls, different expiration dates in November. These are all really short term. So it shows you the degree of gambling that we have. Way out of the money calls, spending about $25 million on those. Can they influence the market maker to push Tesla higher next week? Yes, they can. Unless there's a counter reaction. If we see millions and millions of dollars in puts being bought that dwarfs the 25 million in calls. And then we have bullish long call on PDD Pendudu. They bought the 115 calls for the expiration date, Jan 17, 2025, spending about a little over $2.5 million. All of the Chinese names going down because 
pricing in the new administration, but I think the Chinese names are going to thrive if the dollar pulls back and if investors begin to realize that the US market is fully priced and beyond fully priced and the opportunity is in the cheaper Chinese names. We'll talk about Alibaba when we do the charts analysis and the update by Michael Burry, who's increasing his exposure to Chinese stocks. Then we have DIS Disney. We got a squeeze this week because of the beat on the streaming revenue. And to be honest with you, uh, it's been heading higher before that. We spotted the bullish change in momentum in the charts to watch video and it played out. But now Disney, somebody sees it going even higher. Maybe the shorts getting out, maybe more uh, longs will hop in. So we're looking for value hunting right here. Maybe Disney offers value since it is down for the year. So somebody bought the 115 calls with the expiration date, February 21st, 2025, spending about $2 million. We see another bullish one here. Does it make sense at all for BAC, Bank of America? Buffett is selling, they keep buying. In this case, the 50 calls, the expiration date, February 21st, 2025, spending about $1 million. And then we see SRRK for Scholar Rock Holding. This name skyrocketed this week, massive pump, and somebody see it going higher. They bought the 30 call and the 35 for the expiration dates of Jan 17, spending about $1 million. That tells me right away this is maybe a retail trader because they're buying two different strikes because they hit the limit of 3000 When I look at the chart here, this is the weekly chart for SRRK. It pumped a few weeks ago and it's been holding for now. Uh, usually, if we're not taking the lows from the initial pump, a consolidate for a few weeks, usually that's a leading indicator that we're not through with the upside yet. So maybe this is what they're betting on. Then we segue from the bullish activities to the bearish activities. Even though this one is bullish, but it is bullish for the VIX. Somebody bought the 17 calls and they sold the 27 calls. The expiration date, November 20, 2024. So this is not too far. This is going to be exactly at NVIDIA's earnings. So this is a bet on NVIDIA coming out with a disappointment. But we see a surge in the VIX as a result of that. And they're doing it by opening the spread. The limit for profitability is about 10 bucks, but the entry was about 50 cents. So this could be really profitable if it indeed works out. They spent about $300,000 on those. And we see a bearish one here for the IWM. Every time the IWM pumps, we see huge bearish trades against it as if there is a segment of traders that don't believe in the soft landing at all. In this case, they bought the 217 puts and they sold 192 puts. The expiration date, end of the year, New Year's Eve, and they spent about two and a quarter of a million dollars. We'll look at the chart in a minute. Since we talked about the NVDL bullish trade, here comes the bearish trade against NVIDIA. Somebody bought the 125 puts and they sold the 110 for the expiration date of Jan 17, 2025 spending about $1.3 million. Now, if this trader was not confident, they wouldn't go to January. They would have bought just the weekly expiration or next week's expiration. So here, it shows me a degree of confidence that NVIDIA is going to correct after the report is out. Looking at SMCI Supermicro, they see it going down more. They bought the 17 and a half puts, the expiration date, November 29th, 2024, spending about one and a quarter of a million dollars. And we got, here we go, Palantir. This is how you want to short Palantir. You don't want to go buy the puts for this week because that's a fool's errand. Or next week because either you're lucky with the timing or you're probably going to lose. You buy them for a longer expiration date. Closer to the money, 60, 55. And if by the expiration date, the stock indeed corrects, but it heads below that number, 55 or 60. You exercise these puts and you short the name. That's the safest way to do it. You can short the name right now, then it goes higher and you hit the margin requirement. So using put options is the way to go. But it has to be longer with the intent of actually opening a position and exercising. In this case, they bought the 55 puts, expiration date, March 21st, 2025, spending about three and a half million dollars. Then they also opened the 60 puts, same expiration date, March 21st, 2025, this time around, spending about $1.5 million. And here's the last one for you, perhaps also a shorting opportunity since it went overboard. The valuation doesn't make sense at all right now. But this is what happens when we have short squeezes. Things go crazy and then they crash down again. Uh, one short loses, the other one makes money. And in this case, they bought the 120 puts, the expiration date November 29, 2024, spending about half a million dollars. Now, this one is not a positioning trade because it is for a shorter expiration date. So somebody is timing the decline on Reddit. I'd rather do the same strategy with Palantir. 
Just buy the puts for March, for April next year, close to the money. If the stock crashes, you exercise and you keep the short position. Let's segue to the charts and then wrap it up. We begin with SPY, an hourly chart. What do we see here? We got a gap down Friday, which I don't like because I don't like keeping these gap ups. I like flushes in the mid session because I don't have to worry about filling the gap. With this one right here, it looks to me that we got the maximum pain, 585. And right now we look at the hourly RSI. It is way, way, way oversold right now, which suggests that we could see at least in the pre-market session an attempt for a rebound. Let's say out of a falling wedge formation. Even if you are the most bearish investor out there, and you're looking for the SPY to go down, I think we should go higher Monday, Tuesday, fill the gap above so we don't worry about it anymore, and then NVIDIA disappoints, and then we see the market flushing down in a big way, making lower lows. That would be the ideal bearish scenario. If you are on the bullish side, you probably want to see the market heading further to the downside, becoming really, really oversold, and then NVIDIA comes out, and the bar is way too low, and we see a rebound. So you got to think differently here. If you're bearish, you probably want to see a rebound Monday, Tuesday, maybe Wednesday too. And then you crash after NVIDIA. If you're bullish, you want to see more declines. Monday, Tuesday, perhaps Wednesday. And then you see a rebound after that. Looking at the daily chart for the SPY, what do we see here? We talked about if we have a pullback, we're going down to the 20 days moving average. Okay, we went there. Now what do we do? You have the number of 585.39 on the daily or 585.41 on the hourly. Doesn't matter. We're close enough. You have your 20. I'll take the 20 because it is the lower number. 584.44. If we close below, then we have more declines to come. We're head down to the lower Bollinger Bands. Now before that comes the 50, of course. Uh, but I'd rather that we close the gap above than head down. Now we look at the weekly chart for the E-mini futures. We got the rising wedge pattern. It broke to the downside. Most traders took a short position right away. Correctly so. Only to get smacked in the face with the post-election rally. Where we see a rebound higher. And now traders are chasing the rally. Only to get smacked in the face again with a pullback this week. Uh, I've seen some uh, chartists say that this is probably how you draw the rising wedge. Okay. To me, charting the indices, as I said before, this is not a so popular opinion because we all do it. But to me, charting the indices is voodoo science because you're charting 500 charts at once. That doesn't make sense at all. But we know that the algos are wired to respect the support lines, the moving averages, and the indices charts. And this is why we look at it. So if you want to make a judgment about the S&P, you got to look at the heaviest weight components. The individual chart of Apple, of NVIDIA, of Google, Meta, Microsoft. We'll do some of those in a minute, but before we do that, here's another index for you. The Q's hourly chart. What do we see here? Same thing. Oversold after Friday's dump. Maybe we have a falling wedge. We get a rebound. At least try to rebound. My preference is let's close the gap, then crash after NVIDIA. But usually the market is not going to make it that easy. Looking at the daily chart for the Q's, here we see more damage than the SPY. We see erasing the bull flag pattern that was at least alive all the way till Friday. We closed below the 20 days moving average. The momentum indicator is a lot worse here. So again, it makes sense that the decline in the SPY will be led by the mega cap technology stocks. Why? The only reason that we got this week is a disappointment by NVIDIA. Now we look at the NASDAQ futures daily chart. Here comes the rising wedge. And the question now becomes, did we get a false breakdown a breakout in the realities between or was the first reaction the correct one? As we usually see in these kind of circumstances. And the post-election pump was a trap. And now we go back to the same situation that we got before the elections. That could be the possibility here, but you're not going to know until you break the lows from the post-election decline. And that's going to be in or around 20,000. Again, it's NVIDIA dependent, but if we do indeed head down, uh, we're probably going to go down to retest the September lows. And after that, we have a trend line. If we zoom out to the weekly chart, we have a trend line that goes all the way back since the 23 uh, stabilization and rally in the market. We could be heading down there. And even if we do, we're still maintaining a bullish trend of higher lows. If we break that, then we can talk about uh, more aggressive scenarios. But again, one step at a time right now. Let's see if we're going to revisit the lows. We're going to break 20,000 or not. If we do, we can talk about the September lows. After that, we can talk about the trend line. After that, we can talk about the other trend line, which you can see in the chart right here. But one step at a time, folks. IWM small caps, usually a leading indicator, not do pretty good this week. And we said that you probably want to hold some TZA calls. That's the inverse for the IWM. Or the IWM puts whichever one you prefer. This was a good bet for the week. We see IWM 
uh, flushing down in a big way, losing 223.75, so uh, erasing uh, pretty much the entirety of the post-election pump. And now we still have 224.23 before we say everything is gone. The entirety of the post-election pump is gone. So we get a little bit more. And we'll see if we find support at that point or not. Because you look at the weekly chart. Every time we got to this point at the Bollinger Bands, when we have a gap higher, we got a pullback. The last one let uh, it move higher after all. So that could be the case. The weekly chart still looks okay. But the daily, no, not really. We need to go down and find a support at a lower point, I think, before we have a reassessment about the interest rates because if bond yields are going higher, it doesn't make sense to rally the IWM. What about the dollar? A little bit of a pullback Friday because of the Japanese yen. Maybe it's a little overbought. I mean, you look at the weekly chart for the dollar. It is at a point where it's supposed to find some resistance. And that's the weekly upper Bollinger Bands. Is it going to lead to a reversal as we've seen before? Maybe. That's going to be good for the metals, good for China, good for the industrials, good for a lot of names. Or is it going to be if we zoom out as we've seen back in 22, when the dollar consolidates for a little bit at the upper weekly Bollinger Bands and then continues to expand them higher? In that case, the market is not going to do pretty good. We look at gold futures, it is pretty much at the point where we're supposed to find support. The 100 days moving average, we're a tick below, we're not going to make a big deal out of it. But if the dollar pulls back or consolidates, I think that's going to be enough to see inflows into gold. Because it did a nice correction here. Everybody was complaining about, oh, gold is way too high, I want to wait for a dip to buy. Here's your dip, are you going to buy it? No, you're too scared and you're too distracted with Bitcoin. So that has to be resolved too. We see a pullback in Bitcoin and the dollar. I think that's going to be a really great tailwind for a rebound in gold. Now, is there concern about gold? Yes, there is. Because you look at the weekly chart for gold futures. We closed below the 20 weeks moving average. Momentum is shifting to bearish. Theoretically, if the dollar continues to explode higher, that's going to be, by the way, for really horrific reasons. But if that is the case, stock market and gold will flush down big. But for now, I'm looking at opportunities, trading opportunities in the gold miners, looking at the daily chart, folding wedge, it is oversold. It says to me that at least if we get a pullback in the dollar Monday, Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, you will see gold miners rebounding. Then maybe after NVIDIA, if NVIDIA disappoints, the VIX goes higher, we see a rush to raising cash and the dollar goes higher. We see the miners coming back down. And I like the miners here in gold better than silver, SLV, because the SLV is... At the 100 days moving average, losing that support, expanding the lower Bollinger Bands, and it's not oversold, as we see in the gold miners or gold. So if we have to pick a dip here, I'd rather go with gold or gold miners than silver. What do we see in oil? We talked about the bear flag pattern, played out Friday, but we're still maintaining the critical support of 66.5. If the dollar pulls back, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, any pullback, we'll see a rebound in crude. If not, if the dollar continues to go higher, and there is no flare-up in the geopolitics, then we're probably going to break that support of 66.5. But you got to consider the reaction that we see in energy stocks. So we're looking at the XLE weekly chart. It doesn't seem that energy investors in the stock market level are worried about the recent pullbacks at the commodities level. They see that probably as transitory. And crude is heading higher. Otherwise, they wouldn't be buying energy stocks right now. And you look at the weekly chart for the XLE. It looks, as we've seen in the prior examples, as I'm highlighting right here, that we're changing momentum from bearish to bullish in an ABC breakout, which could produce huge gains. And we see the same thing here, by the way, in OIH, the oil services ETF. A little bit of rejection of the 50 weeks moving average, but if we close above, I think you should be buying the OIH because it's going to retest the sloping line of resistance that you see right now. Uh, XLE definitely looks a lot better than the OIH right now. But there's an opportunity here if we close above the 50 weeks moving average. That's 305. Then you look at the daily chart for the 30-year bond yield. We try to retest 4.44 over and over and over again. It did not break. That leads me to think that maybe we need to head higher. Since the support held pretty good, maybe the chart is forming a bull flag pattern and it's ready to go higher. You look at the weekly chart, keeping support, erasing the topping candle that we got from last week by closing above the close of that candle, maintaining the inverse and shoulder possibility. Folks, I think we might be heading to the highs again in the 30-year bond yield. Now, with that, higher mortgage rates, a more devastation in the economy. So you look at the XHB home builders, really sensitive 
to the interest rates, specifically in the 30. Rejection of the 50 in blue, now flirting with the support of the 100. You lose the 100 in red, you have more declines to come. And you're probably going to look at the weekly chart. Bear flag pattern, holding support right now with the 20 weeks moving average. But again, you lose the 100 on the daily. You lose the 20 weekly. You probably have declines all the way back to the lower Bollinger Bands right now sitting at about 103. So we've done a trade on this one too. The 115, 105 or the 110, 100. I do like the 115, 105 for now. Then we can roll it down after it works out. Then you look at the IYR real estate. It's a similar look. Rejection of the 50 in blue now flirting with the support of the 100 in red. And if you just outlay the charts of the IYR and then the XHB home builders in white, you can see the alignment. Even though we classify XHB as risk on and the IYR as risk off, at the end of the day, you got to remember that the home builders, Lennar, DR Horton, all of them are dividend paying stocks too. And a lot of the real estate plays, they pay dividends, but they're not so divergent from the XHB home builders, which leads me to think that the IYR, as I said before, in reality, is not a risk off exposure. It's a risk on. We're beginning to see that. So if we're betting on a dividend portfolio right now, you want to avoid the ETF you want to buy the individual names. You have to be really picky right now because the IYR, if you look at the weekly chart, if it loses the 20 weeks moving average, it's probably heading into an inverse ABC. But we're going to probably see IYR sub 95. And so, of course, in the 30 year bond yield, to continue to head higher. Now, the risk on yield sensitive segment is the poster boy is the KRE, the regional banks. It's been defying the rise in interest rates, even though the regional banks have the most exposure, the assets held till maturity. I think that the algos are being dumb here. They're just moving the KRE higher because the XLF and the big banks like JP Morgan are catching a bit. Say what you want about JP Morgan, but it benefits from higher interest rates. These guys don't. So this doesn't make sense to me at all. And now we have a rising wedge. We might see a correction in the KRE. You look at the weekly chart, a gap above the upper Bollinger Bands, maybe a topping candle, I think we will see declines in the KRE really soon. Let's look at the Chinese names. Most important one is Alibaba, daily chart. Most important number to keep was the 100 days moving average, and it did keep it. Earnings are out of the way. I think the dollar is a headwind, but if the dollar pulls back, we should see inflows into the Chinese names. We should see Alibaba holding and moving higher from this point on. It's only sentiment that is driving it down. And you look at the big short Michael Burry. He added to Alibaba now his biggest position and then JD, and he's adding to a lot of these Chinese names. I think more investors will see the opportunity when they realize that the US stock market is way, way overbought and we have stimulus in China. We haven't seen the end of that stimulus yet. And you have an economy that may be, big maybe, moving out of stagnation to a little bit of growth with that stimulus. And you have cheap valuations. But again, this is going to be for the deep value investor, not going to be an easy uh, speculative high beta trade where you make money right away. This is going to be a long term kind of investment. Uh, so if you want to make a quick buck, you're better off chasing the stuff that continues to go higher right now. Maybe MicroStrategy, maybe Palantir and see if you're lucky, if you can squeeze a little more gains out of those. But this one is more for a longer term investor because it's going to take a while till we wash away the pessimism of the Trump administration until we find out and realize that the U.S. stock market is overbought and we begin to look for, or overpriced, I should say, and we begin to look for alternatives and we'll find out that the Chinese market is cheaper. And it's worth more exposure. Now we we'll look at the VIX, the volatility index. Look, we haven't seen these kind of gaps before and when we see them, they're usually filled right away. It doesn't take long for the VIX to fill a gap like this. So Friday, we got a big pump. I think we'll get more. I think we're going to close the gap in its entirety. But Monday, Tuesday, we might see more decline in volatility. It hit the 100 days moving average and it pulled back. I think it needs a catalyst to pop higher and close the gap and maybe trade above the gap. And I think that catalyst is NVIDIA. Now, we have to move on the bear to bull advantage line because this is outdated right now. And it's going to be, of course, 1760 in or around the 100 days moving average. If we close above, Market bears have the advantage. If we stay below, believe it or not, the bulls still got the advantage of the market because we haven't seen a lot of damage. We took away some of the post-election rally, but not all of it yet. Keyboard, yet. We will look at Apple Big Kahuna daily chart. What do we see here? It is sandwiched between the 50 in blue and the 100 in red. I say that if before we place a new short in Apple, we need to lose not just the 100, but 223. 
I'd love to see a close below. If that is the case, I'm probably going to open the 220 puts and sell the 215. Expiration date will be probably either November 29th or December 1st. I'm not going to go too crazy here, but it's going to give us a nice pullback trade. And you got to remember, the implied volatility is way too cheap right now. So if we have declines to come and an increase in volatility, you want to play that increase in implied volatility. One way to do it is butterfly puts, or in this case, we can do just a regular spread on Apple. What about the souffle Tesla? It got a little too crazy, pulled back this week, but it didn't do a lot of damage, folks. So there is the possibility that we could see more buying and we do an ABC breakout. That is a possibility. But on the other hand, the case for more declines to come in Tesla comes from the weekly chart. The upper weekly Bollinger Bands, usually you'll do more corrections until you get back within the weekly Bollinger Bands, and then we'll see. The momentum is still bullish, but I think the move is a little too excessive here, and we can correct a little more, maybe 310, 300 even. If that is the case, the trade that we got on the tracker will be handsomely profitable, and then we'll see what happens. If Tesla finds a footing, then maybe it's going to open an opportunity for a long trade. Then we'll look at NVIDIA, most important name, most important event. I would say most important earnings report in at least uh, two to three years. And right now, it doesn't look good for NVIDIA. It looks as we have a rising wedge and we're about to break to the downside and change the momentum from bullish to bearish. Of course, the catalyst is fundamental in nature, not a technical in nature, but this is all we can play with right now. Unless you know what the report's going to look like, you have some insider information, some, some do. And maybe that's why they're betting against NVIDIA on Friday. But from a technical perspective alone, it leans toward a negative reaction. Now, the problem with NVIDIA is if you clean up the chart and you plug in the SMH, this is the chip ETF, the divergence. Since the summer, NVIDIA is up 15%. The SMH is down 6%. As if there is a divergence in the vision, or the rest of the chip sector is saying, watch out, we're not seeing good things here. We got AMD out of the way. We didn't see good things. We got ASML out of the way. Didn't see good things. We got uh, AMAT out of the way. We didn't see good things. Either NVIDIA is going to prove the SMH wrong. In this case, believe it or not, the opportunities in buying the SMH, not NVIDIA. If you think that NVIDIA is going to produce a pleasant surprise. If it doesn't though, and the SMH is correct, in its assumption that we have weakness in chips and it's just waiting for NVIDIA to break before it breaks down. Then you'll see an oversized reaction in NVIDIA and that's going to be the opportunity to short. And lastly, Bitcoin, tulips, what do we see here in the weekly chart? Look, before the elections, folks, I said, give me a break one way or the other, I got a trade for you. Give me a break below the 50 weeks moving average, I got a short trade for you. Give me a break above the sloping line of resistance, I got a long trade for you. We broke and we closed above. We entered a trade, a long trade in BTC even though there was the election risk. But at the later weeks of the elections, the odds and the polls began to change. And it appeared that probably Trump is going to win. So we kept the trade. We got a big pump out of it. But then everybody anticipates that, oh, I'm going to wait till 100,000. Then I'm going to sell my Bitcoin. I think they pulled the rug before the point where everybody anticipates a profit-taking opportunity. And this is why once we got to 89, 90,000, I got out of the trade. It was an election trade for me. It delivered the goal from the trade. That's it. In, out, hello, goodbye. I don't need to be married to Bitcoin, as a lot of traders and investors are. And then when it goes down, they begin to cry the blues. Now, the weekly chart is not overbought. We could see more upside to come. But with the souring sentiment right now about the Trump administration, and an overbought daily chart, the odds would say, look, maybe you're waiting to 100,000. Maybe we'll get there. But I think they pull it back before we get to 100,000. I'm happy with my decision. I'm out. Good luck to the rest of you. And with that, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar this week? Monday, we got the Home Builders Confidence Index. That's going to be important for the XHP and the Lenars of the world, the DR Hortons of the world. That we got more housing data Tuesday, November 19th, with housing starts and building permits. Wednesday, the 20th, we don't have any macro data, we just have more Fed talk. But of course, Wednesday, the 20th, will be the most important day of the week because of NVIDIA's earnings. Then we move on to Thursday, November 21st. We have a bunch of economic data from initial jobless claims. That's always important right now, with the Fed concentrating on the employment mandate. Then we have the Philly Manufacturing Survey, existing home sales, leading economic index, and again, more Fed zombies talking. Friday, perhaps the most important day from a macro perspective, 
And the reason is we got the Flash PMI, services and manufacturing, and then we got consumer sentiment from the University of Michigan. This is going to be the final reading, including inflation expectations. Important week for the housing market from a macro data perspective, but boy, I cannot stress the importance of NVIDIA's earnings. All eyes will be on NVIDIA. Deliver or die. And of course, if it is the die scenario, you gotta keep in mind that we also have the policy risk. And the semiconductors are impacted the most from trade wars and tariffs. So boy, it is an important week. Let's give it a rest right here. We've done a lot. And pick up the conversation on Monday. This is all I got for you for now, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you found the program informative and helpful, please return the favor by pressing the like button, subscribing to the channel, leaving us a nice comment in the section below, and better yet, join us as a member, either here on YouTube or better yet on Patreon, to access the daily coverage and bonus videos. Links in the description. But with that, folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Hope you enjoyed your weekend. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I'll be talking to you again tomorrow. Good night. And I'm not talking about some $400,000 a year working Wall Street stiff, flying first class and being comfortable. I'm talking about liquid. Rich enough to have your own jet. Rich enough not to waste time. Fifty, a hundred million dollars, buddy. A player. Or nothing. You can look